let me show you what the uh, I assume that everyone is looking at my screen now, so I'm sharing my screen. So uh, this is kind of the project. Let me actually run through a bit of. Uh, I don't know if I should use self introduction first, but I only have like two minutes, so I don't want to take too much of your time. So I'm gonna skip all this, I think, and uh, I'm just gonna go into this one. So what we're gonna be doing today is we're gonna be looking at we're gonna be downloading mailboxes. So this is completely running offline. You don't have to upload your mailbox to anything because it's pretty sensitive. And what you do is you visualize the network between um, you know people who you interact um, often and people who are in your sort of in your loop, in your inner loop, <laughs> in a way. So in a way, it's kind of like trying to show you a social network just using it, uh, just looking at your mailbox mailbox data. And this is fantastic for a lot of reasons. One is that it works completely offline. You don't have to trust an online service to do that. So you can, um, if you're curious, all you would do that is that if you want to follow along, um, just go to, if you're using Google, and I assume a lot of you are using Google, just go to takeout.google.com. So pickout.google.com. Um, this is a service by Google that allows you to take an export of all the data that Google has on you. All right. So there are a ton of them, a ton of them. You don't want all of them, actually. So what I'm going to do is I usually click on the deselect all. So there are 47 services. I don't want to go through each one of them. I would just say deselect all. And what I'll do is I just search for mill. So, and I'll just go straight to the mill and this is what I want. I'll just click on that and I'll just say um, download or export. So that's the one I want to click on. All right. So all in all, let me close this one. The step is pretty straightforward. The instructions are also on GitHub. Um, so all you need, if you want to, uh, sort of follow along this demo if you have your laptop with you. But um, pretty much most people use it for to visualize the, that, that stuff, right? Um, but there are also other things like uh, header analysis. So if you're trying to build like a email fraud detection or email uh, scan detection, so anyone who's trying to fish or trying to write a illegitimate email to try and uh, get money out of an unsuspecting victim, then um, you want to sort of detect that you can use the email header analysis and you can take a look at you know the patterns and stuff. So there's a lot of uh, uh, nice, nice built-in uh, utilities there. I'm going to walk you through each one of them. But this is kind of a work in progress. I don't really work on it full time. I don't really work on it. I don't really try to uh, like I don't actively build on it. It's something I do for a one of our client asked for something like that because they were um, there, there were a lot of use cases, but the specific use case at that time, I think the phone is maybe too small. So I'm going to have to zoom out a bit like that. But at the time, um, the use case was that companies were going through lawsuits. Um, I can't go into the details of what kind of company or what kind of industry, but they were going through some litigation, um, uh, some 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 lawsuits. Okay, and th and part of the lawsuit was if somebody sue you for fraudulent activities or tax evasion or anything like that, um, they can they they will there will be auditors that are going to come and investigate everything about the company. So. How do you make sure that your emails are compliant? There is no leak of data. There is no um, um, misinformation. There is no insider trading. Um, all of this stuff. If any um, bad act, bad actors or any kind of uh, 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 illegal activities are happening, you will find them in your email, right? People are gonna send this data when they're not supposed to do that. People are gonna take that and then leak it out to their own personal email when they're not supposed to do that. There are serious people who will take. Um, their own accounts and send it to their own personal email when they're not supposed to do that. There's a lot of compliance issue, governance issue. There's a lot of sometimes uh, concerning privacy issues. And there are sometimes defrauding uh, investors by sending spread uh, uh, fake spreadsheets to the CFO, CFO send it to the CEO and then they, they report that. So all of this stuff all happens on emails. So there are a lot of uh, services out there that try to uh, preemptively look for those kind of patterns first and stop them before they become an issue, especially a like, public company that are usually under uh, a lot of scrutiny. All right. So how do you how do you build a tool that, that sort of do all that? So a lot of these services are out there, and they are very expensive. You usually find somebody like an expert to 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 perform all of this on a company wide level. So um, I can't go into more details about what the client needs it for in specific, but that's kind of the the background. So we did we developed that, and we make it a little bit more generalized. So um, you can read more about uh, th those background, and we can talk about that maybe at the end of the, the whole demo. But um, now I want to pause a bit because I'm going to hop into Visual Studio Code and I'm going to run through some demo here and to show you the nice graphics and stuff. But before that, I want to make sure there are no questions or if there are anything you want to ask, um, you can put them in, uh, in, in, in the chat here or in the comments. Uh, I don't know if you're allowed to unmute yourself. If you want to ask me in person, you can also do that. So uh, every, every five minutes, I'm going to hop in here. If there are questions, I'm going to pause and take those questions. Uh, but if there's none, I'm just going to move on and um, uh, uh, show you the code demo. So maybe anyone wanna uh, have any questions so far about what I or what I just said? 
Um, no questions so far. Everyone is good. Um, I mean the 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 audience that are on the site um, and and audience online. Um, Oh, the technical issues. Oh, yeah. So sorry. Yeah. Right. So so the, the the background of that is that we had a client who uh, basically this whole idea was uh, there, there are actually things like that. There are things like you can pay a lot of you can pay a lot of money to get uh, third party compliance auditors, uh, regulators. Sometimes it, if, if you ever been through a public company and if the company ever get into any kind of litigation issues, you typically go, have to go through this. All the employees have to sort of they have to be investigated. The emails have to be investigated because email contains a lot of information about bad activities, um, you know, uh, 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 illegal activities or uh, finding who is complicit in this, who is leaking out this information, who is trading the stock on this information and who is uh, unwillingly or willingly, you know, uh, passing on this information to outsiders or who is taking data that they're not supposed to take. So all of this you can find from email. So basically we built a utility tool to sort of help that process. Um, I'm not able to disclose what kind of industry was uh, we're working with, but at the time uh, we worked with a client, we developed that. That was the background. Sure. Right. So yeah, I'll, I'll see the chat because I'm gonna hop back in and um in and out. So if you have questions, um, uh, Diamond, just go ahead and ask your questions, and I will um I'll, I'll see the questions. Um, if not, I will um if if you're on site, then uh, I guess you can leave your questions to the end, and I'll, I'll address them. But it's a pretty interesting project. We work on it, and we deliver that to the client. We build a, and the whole thing has to be running offline because this is so uh, the, the, there is so much sensitive information about your own mailbox. So all of this stuff should be completely offline. You can disconnect the internet while running off this if you're very paranoid. <laughs> anyway, um, just to make this uh, uh, the, the whole experience a little bit easier, uh, you can just go to the link and just walk through, um, you know, how do you go to Google Takeout and take out all of that data. Uh, basically, Google Takeout is a fantastic service. It gives you I don't, I don't know if fantastic is the right word for that, but uh, you can every data that Google ever collects from you, um, you will be able to export them. Same thing, there are like mailboxes like Outlook and stuff. You can do the same thing here, but you can look at like what does uh, Chrome knows about you? What does uh, Classroom knows about you? What does Context knows about you? And um, you should dis you should deselect all of them for this for the purpose of this exercise. This select all of them and only select the one um, mailbox search for mail and only take the, the one that is this one, the mail. And it will give you the inbox format, the inbox uh, format, and that's the format that you want, and you should be good to go. But just to make it even easier for you, um, one of my team member, uh, Aurelia, um, she has created a Google Collab notebook. So you can also click on this Google Collab notebook. And so if you don't want to set up your IDE and stuff, but you want to follow along the whole uh, exercise, you can just run it top to bottom. Um, and then just to make it even easier, we also pack in a fake demo email uh, mailbox. So if you run this exercise without your own mailbox, um, it will just use the fake demo uh, test mailbox. So all of this will come from the uh, fake um, demo mailbox. So it's up to you. If you want to perform it on your own, go ahead, uh, load it in. If you are very paranoid, then disconnect the internet. But if you still don't want to do any of that, you still want to follow along, then just use the, the, the fake demo that we provide to you, the fake mailbox that we provide to you. Um, but if there are any questions, I'll take them at the end. So now I'm going to go into Visual Studio Code and I'm going to run um, the code demos for you, and I'm gonna see if um, anyone you know have troubles uh, following the process. But generally, I'm just gonna show you to you how, how easy it is, right? I'm just gonna copy most of this, and I'm gonna explain them line by line. And go we'll click on the copy. There is a copy uh, icon here, and then you're going to create a new file, whatever you want to name it, and just paste it in there. And remember, that the only thing you need to change here is really the mailbox. So this is the the uh, the path to your inbox. So for me, I already did the steps earlier, the Google Takeout path, so I already have that. So I'm just gonna remove all of this and just pass in my path, which is uh, supertype.inbox because I have a lot of emails, um, accounts. And so this one I export from my supertype uh, uh, company. So this is basically, uh, let's add a comment here. This is my, this is my um, mailbox. I should turn off the, uh, from my supertype.ai domain. Okay, so that's one of my company. I have uh, a few mailboxes. I also work for other companies, so I have a few other um, uh, emails. So this reminds me that, okay, this is from my supertype.ai. So these are, I, everything you see in here are actual, my actual email. So if you see some content, that's my actual email. I'm not, this is not a fake email. And uh, the first step, when you open up a file, you paste in all of that stuff. You see there are some print statements. You can remove them if you don't want to. Um, you can also just bring up all the imports up there. Um, just to have it tidy, nice and tidy. 
So the first step is we build out an uh, Nbox reader and we load in where the path is. So this is wherever your path is. If this is in a downloads folder, I think on a Mac uh, or on a Linux, it would be very simple. It would just be home or something like user and then you have your local. Um, I don't actually use a Windows. I use, uh, I'm traveling right now, so I'm using MacBook, but at home I use a Linux machine. But on the Windows, I believe it looks something like this. I believe it looks something like program, files or something. So you will need to uh, sort of configure this to, to fit um, <laughs> a desktop or whatever, right? Where, where you have that. Um, I'm not going to worry about that. I already put it in my local file, so I'm just going to change all of that. Uh, so I won't have all of this. I'm just going to have a simple uh, uh, user relative um, link to that. But if you want to specify a, uh, an absolute path, you can do that. And then I'm just going to print how many emails in there. So this is really simple. This is just a length and I'm using the F string. So because of that, if you look at the code here, it asks you to have Python 3.7. So um, the way I build out this package is that I rely on a few very uh, new Python stuff. So I don't know how many of you have heard of like data classes. So data classes is a Python 3.8 feature, 3.7 feature. So um, that if you have used uh, data classes, data classes is built in Python um, and that comes only with 3.7. So I built the package using some of this, uh, take advantage of some of the latest Python version. So you do need to use that. So a full detail of uh, a full list of what are the new features that we use. Why do you need this to be a 3.7 dependency? Uh, it's because of these other features that we use. So I use insertion order dictionaries. I use typing. I use data classes and I use the F string. This which is in 3.6. So in order to install all of this, you just have to open up a terminal and you just have to do something like hit install and you just have to go and type email network. That's all you need to do. All right. If you already have one one of this, you just have to do upgrade like this. And so you just say pin install upgrade email network. It should run really, really fast because it's very light. It's only the only dependency is network X. So network X uh, gives us utilities to work with network graph. Um, if any of you is interested in like the, the graph theory side of things, we can talk about the directed graph, undirected graph. We can talk about that um, after the demo, maybe. All right. So this is kind of the only thing you need to do. So pip install dash dash upgrade. If you want to upgrade, if you don't care about that, just pip install email network. And now you're in Visual Studio Code, that's kind of it. I'm going to save it and then I'm going to do a quick uh, subset. So indexing, indexing the, the, the six email because it starts from zero. And then I'm going to just extract the meta action. So meta information is going to give me like who is the recipient, who is the sender, who is in the CC, who is in the VCC, what is the subject, a ton of meta information. And I'm going to store them in email message. I don't really need any of this. In fact, I could delete all of that if I want to. So I could delete all of that. Don't and then what I'm using is this thing called the interactive mode. So when you run a Python file, you could say Python and you say live.py, which is the name of the file, and it would execute that file, right? But what you can also do is you can actually put a dash i, which runs this whole thing in interactive mode. So if I go ahead and hit enter, now it's going to go ahead and run this, but it's also going to bring me into the console and I have access to all these things that I just created. So it includes the reader, it includes the email and the email message. So that's really nice for me to just sort of uh, interactively, interactively just look through um, what are importance and what are things that I want to, you know, maybe take a note of and I don't have to keep running the same pie file. So if you're finding yourself keep going in there and then, oh, let me change that and then let me run that again, change that, run it again. Um, probably don't do that. Instead, run it using the, 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 the dash I flag, which is uh, what I'm doing here. And so the first line already execute, it says that's the mailbox reader currently have 1,807. And then it starts to print a few things. It prints the email recipients. So I see that this is my email. So if you are actually looking at this video, please do not spam me. Uh, that's my actual email. <laughs> but I mean, if you have actual concerns you want to ask me, feel free to, to do that. I welcome all kinds of emails, but just don't put me on your uh, promotion <laughs> list. Um, and then there is the domain. So you extract that. Okay. So all of this is cool. So let's take a look at the email. So I already loaded this. This is the sixth um, email from my mailbox, right? So let me print that out and I can say email and it will print out the mailbox.mbox message. And from there, I can I can start to take a look at what is the content and stuff. Now, I'm not sure I'm going to do that because I'm recording this session. So I'm going to be looking at the content, but you can, there, there's so many utilities that are built in here. I can also look at email message to look at only the meta. And I can see here that in the meta, I will see the subject. And I will see the date time, uh, the, the date, the recipients, the CC, and the origin domain. So origin domain is that where did that email originated from? I want to take a quick question here. Is the font too small? Because this is already zoom in on a couple of levels, but I'm afraid that if you are sitting too far behind and you can't see it, um, do you need me to I don't know, change? Can you can you can you follow along just fine? Can you let me know really quickly before I um, proceed? Font is all right. 
Okay, thank you, Jerome. What about um, what about the audience that are there? Do you think the phone is okay? Can you read them? I won't. I won't hear them anyway until somebody told me. Oh, it's fine. Okay, so I'm just gonna assume that it's fine, all right, for online. Um, so that's how you can. This is the easiest get started. You could delete all of this now, and you could just work from there. So this is really it. Uh, you bring in the, the extract. So in fact, we don't have to put them in two lines. We could just put them into one single line. Um, the reason why uh, it's all in separate lines is because this is a documentation from GitHub. So we just sort of break things down to be clear, but you could have done that as well. And so the first one is the inbox reader. We put in the path to that inbox. By now you should have your inbox. If you follow along the project at the beginning, um, going to your Google takeout and actually exporting that, uh, you should have your inbox now, unless it's a really huge, like 10 years I've been using that, for example, I don't know. And then there's the extract meta to extract all that meta information. All right. So, um, and I'm gonna just paste, uh, oops, I think I, okay, I don't wanna delay all of them. I'm just gonna show you like you can do that. And what else do we have? Oh, we also have the filter. So you can also filter by a few conditions. We're gonna rewrite this a little bit to use something more general so that you can just use the data operator without having to call it like that. Uh, this is kind of intent in, in uh, initially when we first created for the, for the client, it wasn't a big use case. We just sort of do the easier thing, but we're gonna rewrite that part. But you can also say, I wanna filter for all the emails. And this is how we do it. You say filter emails. And then from there you pass in a date string. And you said, I want to filter for any dates um, uh, that is later than or later or equal to 5th of January. And then you can uh, you know, just create a variable called this year meals. So these are all the meals that are from here. So in this case, it would be something like 2022, 01, 01, just to show you that we haven't refreshed the project in a while. Okay. And so you can also see this year meals, for example. You can also print the length of this year meals. How many of them are there? So you can say, oh, how many emails do we have this year? So this is really simple already. Already you can see there are some use cases here that you could find it very hard to do using you know, the Gmail own tools. You can't just subset for things like that and then quickly export and visualize them. But this one makes it easy. You can do it programmatically. You can create tools on top of that. So already you can see some use cases there. But we also see that there are some, um, we can see recipients and stuff. So let's take a look at that. Say email message, and we can say dot recipients, and we see okay, this is the the guy. Um, what's the name? What's the email? Right, and then we can finally extract all emails. So we can say say emails in here. All right. Now let's take a look at the visualizing a few things, and then we go back to see some questions. Um. All right. So this is all cool, and let's go ahead and just maybe plot directed. Just do a just do a plot. All right. Very simple plot. Um. So I'm gonna just go ahead. The, the reader is really created up here, so I don't have to do anything. I just add the line plot redirected, uh, plot directed, and then put in the reader, which is created in line five. And then I just have to give it a style, a, a type. So I don't have plot directed, so I need to import that, right? So importing, importing, you can also just go ahead and just import all of them in one go so that you don't have to do it one by one. So I'm gonna just import all of them in one go and I'm gonna just plot directed. So there are two types of plots, generally speaking, because this is on network. So they are undirected and directed. Directed is kind of like there is a direction between that. So for example, the boss to a subordinate, uh, your manager to a uh, supervisor to an employee, there is a direction of, of, of the relationship. Uh, undirected is probably things like, uh, for example, siblings or, or, or spouses, you know, husband and wife. There is no direction to, to that. It's just like they have a relationship. There's no direction. So you can see this is a pretty big mailbox because uh, I, I use my email a lot. And so these are all the, uh, this is, these are all the relationship here. So you can see that there's a lot of connections go back to me, which is all the way here. Um, but who have a thicker line and stuff. And, um, you can try and make them a little bit less messy by not plotting the whole thing. So what is typically more, what is more typical is something like you would subset first. You say, I want to subset for all the emails that happened within March to April, because that is the last month of the employee. So the employee is going to leave in the end of April and you suspect that the employee is secretly holding a lot of information about the client and secretly emailing it out to himself because he's going to leave the company and he want to carry along all the accounts. All right. And this is very common. If you ask any sales manager, these are things that are quite common in companies. So you suspect that, that behavior, that activity. So what you do is you subset for only email that happened between March and April and you visualize that. All right. Um, if you actually work in the HR of any company, big di division, you usually already have access to, um, your, the, the employees, uh, work mailbox anyway. Right. So it's very easy to just download that and then you subset for that. So it's not common to just down visualize the whole thing from the beginning of time. It's, at least the way we use it, we don't do it like that. Um, here for illustration purposes, I'm showing you that, but it's more commonly you do some sort of subsetting. Another example is you find 
uh, let's say there is a company, there is an employee who violated a non-compete clause, leave the company, and then start a company, start start another agency or something that competes with the former company, company uh, employer. And you want to only subset for email that involve the employee because you want to investigate that that only that particular employee. So you would also do a subsetting before you do a, a, a visualization. So it's not common that you have something like blown up or the whole thing here. You won't, it's, I mean, the way I use it, the way we use it, we don't, do the whole thing. But anyway, that's that. Um, you can also say that I want to only see, I only want to visualize where two or three of more or more employees are involved. So I don't want to I don't want to visualize anything be below that threshold. So anytime there are more than three employees with on the CC or BCC list, then subset for that and then visualize that. You can do all kinds of subsetting and then you can uh, visualize that. And in terms of plot, there's also a few style. Um, you can read the documentation, but I'm gonna show you a few more examples. Uh, this is another example. You can also plot them using I'm using a different style. This one, the, the earlier one, I showed you the shell, but now I'm going to use the spring. So let's run that. And graph ML, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, actually, I'm going to, yeah, I can keep it true. I'm going to explain what it is later. So um, there is also an optional parameter, graph ML. It defaults to false, but you can set it to be true. And when you set it to be true, it doesn't just visualize that. It also exports something called the graph ML. Um, uh, extension, a file that, that you can use and plot them into graphing software. So it works very nicely with all kind of third-party graphing software. If you use any kind of third-party graphing software, there's a good chance GraphML is supported. So you can also export that to be a GraphML and then you can use the GraphML with a third-party software if you so choose to. Uh, just be careful that all of this is your, if these are your actual email data, then you want to be careful where you upload them to. I generally don't recommend you use any online service unless you really know what you're doing. Um, yeah, so that's that. If you use some sort of offline service, it's probably fine. This whole thing works completely offline, all right? Uh, but if you're trying to take the inbox and you're trying to push it to an online service, I would say just think twice about whether that's really the kind of thing you want to be doing, all right? So that, that's it. Uh, this is the second layer. There's a few other layers you can choose. I won't go into all of them because they will take too much of your time. I want to be respectful of your time. But uh, what I'm doing is I'm just plotting, you know, one by one. I'm just looking at uh, the, the examples here. I could also plot a single email. I don't want to see the whole thing. I want to plot just a single email. I could do that. For example, I could go ahead and just copy this one, plot a single directed. I'm just going to copy that. Um, and I'm going to go back to my visual data code, paste it in. And now I have a simple one. So um, here's the email, how startup financing routes get oversubscribed and it sends to my email box. So there are people who probably spam me. I don't know. All right. So you can also just say, I want to only plot this particular email. You can do that as well. And then there's the email header analysis. So um, header counter. And let me find. Okay, header counter is gonna from email network import. So this is where I, you know, immediately I can see where I need to improve the documentation. I should actually have this import um, within my, within my sort of my readme, but uh, yeah, I don't have that, but okay. so. Header counter is also another utility that you can import. I'm going to bring that in and I can then take these two lines. I can just say create a headers. Just look at all the headers. Oops. Um, I'm going to copy that, paste that in, paste. And then I'm going to just say here. And it's going to generate the, the histogram and uh, you can see what are things that contain that. What are, what are some very common uh, headers or metadata in a way, right? Um, to a layman, it's kind of like metadata. What are the metadata attached to each email and sort of plot that out as well. So you have the header uh, counter and now you can see of that, you see um, most of my emails, a lot of all, almost all the emails will always contain the received metadata. That, that is kind of a, a given, but some emails, let me maybe zoom out a little bit. Um, Okay, I'm using this MacBook and sometimes it does that to my plots, but it's okay. It's okay. No big deal. So you can see most of all, almost all emails would at least have the received metadata, but then you also see some of them will contain other information. Uh, some of this information could be really useful to spam detection. If you're trying to do some sort of spam uh, detection, you can do that or some sort of like uh, anti anti phishing. You can also do that. Um, not all, not every email contains the subject or from or to, but a lot of them also contain that. So you can have the you can you can sort of take a look at all of that. And let's go back in and take a look at. Um, so for example, you want to see all the. Let me just run this and then explain that. It's easier to do it that way. All of this, by the way, is on GitHub. Uh, so you don't have to worry about like um, you know copying or, or trying to screenshot anything. It's all on GitHub, so you can just go ahead and do that. You can take a look at spam headers. This is really simple. Um, uh, all the headers that contain things that are related to spam. 
So I, I initially thought about making this a, a sort of a utility function as well. And then I'm like, why do we need, why does this need to be a utility function? It's really a simple one-liner Python script. Um, so it basically checks for all the headers that is in there. And it's like, does that header contain the word spam? If it does, then return that. So you have Microsoft anti-spam, um, um, forefront, uh, exchange, uh, spam status, anti-spam status, and yeah, Ali mail anti-spam. So there are people who are, you know, who use Ali mail. So anyway, there, 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 you, you can, you can, I'm sure, you know, uh, if any of you have some experience in Python, you can, this is very simple to understand. Basically just look for spam and try to take all the value, convert that to lower. So lower case, and then look for the word spam. If it's in there, then return the keys. And that's kind of it. And then just put them in a li nice list. There are also domain summary. You can see what are the domains that you most commonly interact with. So I could just go ahead and do that. Copy that, paste it in, say paste, run that. So here it's going to give you a summary of all the emails that you interact with. So who are your most important clients, for example, if you're a account, if you're a sales manager, account manager, what are the external domains that you interact most with? And so those are information you can also glean from. And uh, it's also very simple, uh, one or two lines of code, basically just import the domain summary and then you call that. And now you have that, you can just do a plot. So summary dot plot, and it will just generate a plot for you. And you can, of course, you want to change the size, the figure width of that. Um, make it a little bit better, but I'm not, I'm not like uh, those things. Again, the, the most common use case is that you don't do that across the whole 10 years of uh, history. You don't do that. It's not common. Uh, what you typically do is you do some sort of subsetting. I just try to save time and speed up because I know it's only 20 minutes. I don't want to like do too much in too little time. Um, but for you, the typical use case is you look at, okay, this employee in the last three months of um, this employment, um, what are the most common emails or domains that this person interact with? And it's more common to use it that way than to be like, okay, here's my mailbox. Let's visualize the entire thing, everything from the start of time. Um, uh, uh, we, we rarely use it that way. Okay. So that's kind of it. Um, and I will say that there are a lot of, right now what we're seeing, a lot of people use it for, um, so there are a few use cases. Uh, discover subgroups within your organization, uh, the different task force established, whether it's cohesive, whether there's some sort of tribalism where, you know, in, in a big company, usually there are a few people who hang out very closely with each other, but not everyone else. So the key social groups, um, social actors, who the, the relative influence of people, you know, people who, who who brings the whole thing together, you know, like the, the guys that makes everyone around them looks, looks good, right? Uh, key account managers of the company. So for example, you can say that, okay, Margareta, for example, despite being with the company, uh, in a shorter period of time, she is more connected to more key clients than her peers. You can also visualize that. Um, so you probably time to give Margareta a, a promotion and you can compare distributions and patterns of email behaviors and aggregated statistics between group of, uh, group of employees. Um, there, are, there are also other things. Some of them are really implemented. Like for example, the supporting the directed, the undirected, uh, that was really uh, implemented. Some of them, this is also already implemented. And there are a few other statistics. Like if you study graph theory, there are things like betweenness, closeness, hotness, distance. If you study graph theory, you wonder, can I compute the statistics for that? Um, the answer is yes, but we haven't really, um, pushed it into main. So we haven't really merged that feature, but, um, I don't know. We, we, if, if it's a very highly requested one, we probably, uh, prioritize that. So, those are kind of the key points there. And I want to go back to my slides, but I think I should stop and see if there are questions. Uh, no, it doesn't just work with Gmail. It works with anything as long as you can provide an inbox. So inbox is kind of the standard. If you use Outlook or Hotmail, all you need to do is to just search for like that, like search for Outlook, export to inbox. And you just have to read up like, how do you export that? So it works with anything that you can reasonably export to it. Uh, Mbox and Mbox itself is a standard. So um, Diamond to sort of answer your question, it will work with anything that follows standard, that follows. If you use Hotmail on uh, Outlook, just do a quick search, Mbox, um, Outlook, Mbox, export, that's it. Do, do you have plans for, to apply the same tag, but for other mediums of communication like private messages? Yes, I think we, 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 uh, the, the thing about our team is we are kind of small. So I have, uh, I run two companies. My first company have about 60 full-time employees and the second company have about seven to eight employees. So we are a very small team. So we, we have a lot of things planned, but we typically prioritize very ruthlessly. But if, for example, if a client comes to us and like, oh, we're willing to, pay for you to expand the project and stuff, that's something we pick up very fast. So kind of we need to balance uh, putting bread on the table and also like things that we love to do. But but this is something that um, it, it, when we didn't think about this idea, it was a client request that came to us 
So they're like, we needed that, but we wanted to work offline. We don't trust any online service. So that was a perfect use case for us. We're like, okay, what if you build a pattern package? You can use it completely offline, use it for your own mailbox. But I can see that being used in things like WhatsApp and stuff because WhatsApp also have groups. So you can look at groups that are commonly created. And so, you know, in a big company, a lot of times you create groups that you exclude your boss out. For example, in Sears, everyone is in the group and then you export your sales manager. You, you exclude him, right? Or like your, everyone is in that group except the CEO. So you get to talk about things without worrying about that. that, that uh, you know? So um, I talk about this as if I have personal experience. I don't actually have that personal experience because I tend to be the guy that, 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 that is excluded. So I don't know what I'm talking about here. But but I I, I have enough uh, self-awareness to know that's happening. Uh, so yeah, you can also take a look at that. You can see, you know, uh, maybe between them, who replies to who the most. If somebody writes something, you know, on WhatsApp, you can reply to that guy. So yeah, you can also do that. Kind of thing. I can see a lot of use cases for that. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll be happy i mean if you if you want to like take that and, and sort of build on top of that or like a great package doing just that you can also you know i'll be happy to see it um and happy to talk about that um oh you think that network is quite difficult i i i have actually considered that as well um i forgot if it's because of uh the the trying to keeping dependency low um because it's not totally a self-hobby project it was more like uh, we need to meet certain like criteria for the clients and stuff uh, also the fact that network x itself um our team have done some work on it before so we we stick to that but i can see if this is completely a passion project a personal pet project i i could see a pretty big argument to not use network x because like you said there are um, like pyris is pretty cool as well um graphy is pretty cool so that I, I can see i can see a few um i can see pretty convincing arguments about why you would Pick a different one. Uh, I think at the time it's not a totally like a pet project. It's not up to us. It's kind of like we need to meet certain constraints, so we uh, stick to that. I can't remember exactly why, but uh, that was that. But yeah, I I, I feel like if you have ideas, you want to port it to a different visualization. There, there are so many things you can do with it. Um, and yeah, really happy to uh, to to see how to uh, support you with uh, with that. But th thanks for all the questions. Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, what about the guys um, not online? Um, do you guys have questions you want to ask? Uh, I mean, I can keep on talking to uh, you know, uh, guys uh, in, the, in the chat room here. But what about uh, folks who are not uh, not from not not online here? And, and building this project is also pretty cool because um, we also use a few other tools uh, to, to sort of I mean, these are these are things that are not related to that, but we, for example, we, we set up, so we have tests and stuff. Uh, if you want to contribute to a project, you need to pass your tests. So pass the test, uh, you send a PR, then we use GitHub Actions. So it's all like CI, CD stuff. So in GitHub Actions, for example, every time you put, make a pull request, uh, it goes through the test. And if you look at the test, if I show you how it looks like, um, you see if the test doesn't pass, uh, for example, if the test doesn't pass, then it will, it won't, it will reject that. And then just to show you how that look like, so it, 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 I think this is in 2021. So I think this was a relatively new feature back then and we enjoy using it because um, in the process of that, we also learn how to set up a CI. You can even go as far as CI CD, the whole process where if you push a new thing and you merge to the main, it automatically relates to PyPI. So anyone could just do a pip install and immediately get that. You can set up all kind of like fancy tests here. So, um, and, and also when you set up this kind of test, it's really cool as well because uh, all of this is in YAML format. So it's code, it's sort of like code version control in a way like it's it's all a single file it's like configuration as, as code kind of like docker very very beautiful very a beautiful pattern and then um so when somebody tried to install that um they oh yeah yes yeah i i i, I do i do i do hear you do you hear me what, what about guys online do you hear me Oh yeah, they, they 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 do hear me. So I, I'm wondering, like maybe it's the offline thing. Yeah, maybe it's an offline thing. But but yeah, um, I was just talking about the when when you can also build out like um, you don't have to. So for example, you want to support anyone who's using three point seven, three point eight, three point nine. How do you guarantee that, right? How do you guarantee that your package would always work if it's on three point seven, three point eight, three point nine? Now in the past, without all of this, you would think that okay, maybe I just have to install in different virtual environments and I'll have to test that manually. What if you have like 11 versions to test on? And then you have to test against Ubuntu, Mac, and Windows to make sure that your package would always work consistently against Windows, Mac, and Ubuntu. So these are a lot of things to manually test, right? So the good thing about using something like CI CD is that you build a package, 
and you said, hey, whenever somebody commit, uh, make a new commit, before you push it, before you merge it, go ahead and check, uh, use Ubuntu, use Python 3.7, 3.8, 3.9, test and make sure all the tests pass and then move on to Mac OS. And then again, Python 3.7, 3.8, 3.9, all the tests have to pass. And then finally Windows. And so it kind of, it saves you so much time. Like we could not imagine doing development any other way once you, um, you know, got used to that workflow. Um, so you have like the run command, you said, okay, first pip install and then pip install dash r. Dash r stands for recursive. So basically you look at the requirements and then recursively install each one of them and then go ahead and um, do your PyTest and uh, make sure it pass on all of that. If not, reject the push, uh, reject the pull request. So that's kind of a, that, that's how we, we sort of architect the whole thing and it saves you a lot of time. I mean, it takes a bit of setting up, right? You need to go and make sure that you have the GitHub actions and stuff. But once you set it up, um, it it is the best ROI you can have as a as a tech lead, I guess. Um, you know, a lot of us are like developers here, so uh, save you a lot of time. You don't have to manually test it. Oh, oh, it doesn't work on three point eight on if you're using on Windows. It doesn't have that kind of issue. Um, yeah. So I wonder if there are questions relating to any of this. Okay. Thank you.